Hi, everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds, talking with a, a master crafts person on this episode, and this is Mari Naomi. Mari, Hello. welcome. Thank you so Hi. much. For <laughs> it is absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for saying yes and jumping in and joining, and I'm appreciating the art in your environment right now. Um, my kitchen. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a place for art as well. I imagine you probably do art where, wherever you are. That would yeah, be my no, sense. I would really love my own workspace, which I haven't had since I moved into this place a, a year and a half ago. But um, I'm actually building a studio right now, like or having it built right now. So hopefully in the next couple of months, I'll have some place that's away from all the noise and all the dirty dishes and the urge to clean everything before I start working. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I get that. I get that. The dishes would have to be clean uh, oh and put away in order for work to happen, at least for me. Um, totally. No, any excuse not to do the things that I love, apparently. <laughs> right, right. That That is just how those things go. Um, so you and I were talking a little bit before I hit record. And I think I want to say the first book that I discovered of yours was Losing the Girl. And that was one of those things where I, I just try to read as widely as I can. Being a teacher, being a person who loves literature and particularly visual literature, uh, I try to explore a lot. And I came across that book on NetGalley, I think it was. Uh, and so immediately connected with that. And I think you and I did a written interview on my blog, Once Upon a Time. Um, yeah, I, I think that's right. <laughs> you do a lot of these things, I'm sure. Um so so great to talk with you in, in a live action Zoom setting as opposed to sort of sending questions by email back and forth. Yeah, nice to see you almost in real life. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I am almost real. I'm <laughs> at least as real as the bookshelf behind me. Um, <laughs> if not a little more so, if not a little more so. Um, so yeah, I'm curious about your your author origins, your path to creating uh, visually and verbally. Um, well, I so I'm about to turn 50 in August, and um, from a very young age, I I really wanted to be a novelist, um, prose novelist, and. Uh, so I was really, really hyper motivated for that when I was a kid. And by the time I was 18, I wrote my first book. By the time I was 21, I wrote my second novel and I was trying to get them pu published. And I was like, oh, this is not the same experience as writing. This is horrible. Um, mm. And so that's when my dream of that died. And I switched to uh, something a little more career oriented uh, so I, I got a job in video games and became a video game writer after a number of years and so that's how I was supporting my art around that same time I um, had recently like in my early 20s discovered uh, underground comics mm -hmm. and blew mm -hmm. my mind and they were so personal and um, to down to earth and reading Twisted Sisters, uh, the anthology by Diane Newman, editor, uh, specifically Mary Fleener's uh, story, The Jelly, it, which was about her hot mess of a roommate. I was like, oh, I have stories like this. I love to draw. Uh, I would love to make comics. And so I just, like a mad person, just began making comics. And I haven't stopped. That was in 1997, February of 1997. Never stopped. Um, but, you know, it's one of those, the many hobbies that I have. Like, I've always loved painting, collage, and, and you know, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever reason, comics is sort of what ended up taking off. As a, and, and I was also, again, working in video games. So I was making my money there. And then the comics sort of took off and to the point where I couldn't do both. So I had to make a decision to kind of cut off. The job that was giving me more money <laughs> right right to pursue the comics thing so uh you know it's it there's been ups and downs <laughs> but yeah. that's how I got it. Uh, but it was truly I never intended it to be a career it was going to be a hobby um 
but with the rise of graphic novels and graphic memoirs in the early 2000s, like that's it's sort of where I went, but that was never my intention. I just wanted to make the art and enjoy it and share it with friends and family. Nice, nice. Yeah, and I, I know that there has to be passion there because I know graphic novels take a long time to put together. They're, they're quite the long haul and... Uh, yeah, hours and hours of thinking, writing, oh. prepping. And yes, my first book, Kiss and Tell, which came out in 2011, I had started working on that in, in 2003. Uh, yeah, and I, I, it's not that I, I wasn't working on it full time. It was my, it wasn't my day job, but I was pretty consistently working on it um, in the form of mini comics that, and it just turned into something bigger. So. By the time I got my first publishing deal in 2009, like I'd been working on it for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was Harper Collins put out my first book. And uh, yeah, it just all kind of blew up from there. It was good then, yeah. 20 years later, I'm starting to get footing. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's a nice history of sort of a, you mentioned the mini comics and sort of that approach being collected. And I'm just thinking about Alison Bechtel and, and that amazing work um, that's sort of shared, been shared with the world. And uh, I mean, I, I love how indie comics and underground comics have sort of found footing as far as being something that's a little more on the surface now. And people are appreciating the variety of stories that can be told in comics as opposed to just one or two kinds of stories. Oh, yes. I still think that zine fest and in mini comics are the, where to go if you're looking for something new and exciting. I feel like everything, you, pretty much everything you see that's being published has really gone through the ringer. Um, mm -hmm. We were going to talk a little bit about my newest book, which is really weird. Um, and I feel like a lot of really weird stuff doesn't get seen by a lot of people um and i got yeah. super lucky that i found a good publisher and that it's actually resonating with people and um, this is the book i thought you loved me it's um a collage memoir uh, and oh, I love it. Love it. uh but i feel like because i've been th this is my ninth book and because i've been doing so much other stuff i was able to like push my weird stuff into the forefront mm -hmm. but it's really uncommon for that to happen and i find the most exciting inspirational stuff is still at zine fest made you know stapled together by hand and made in very small collections yeah that that arena is very much thriving and that's yeah very exciting over there <laughs> yeah I, I find as a reader but also as a teacher i i'm I've seen the things, you know, I've seen the traditional approaches. I've seen the storytelling. I've seen the middle grades graphic novels. I appreciate them. I've seen the, you know, like really commercial graphic novels. I appreciate those. So when, when someone does something different with the medium or pushes, as you said, pushes that weirdness out there or something we haven't seen before, I just, I really appreciate that. And, and it's worth talking about. So, uh, and you mentioned I collage, which I love. I'm drawn to the weirdest things I get, like, even if I don't love it, even if it doesn't resonate with me. Um, my book was inspired by some books that didn't resonate with me, but just kind of gave me permission to try something new. And I was like, oh, wait, you can make a book purposely hard to read, like, and, and try to, you know, make a reader think about it as opposed to oh, just yeah. reading on a plate, which I, you know, of course that kind of, I love those books too, where they're easy to read and you just like lie on the beach or in a tub and read them. But like the stuff that really sticks with me is stuff that makes me think about it or like kind of work a little harder or that contains more nuance. It's not as, you know, a lovable protagonist and all that sort of thing. Like those are the books that make me feel alive, that make me feel, feel curious about the world and realize that there's so much more to see. And, and that's exactly what I want to put out in the world too. So, because that's what inspires me, but I also, I also write, like, I just wrote a middle grade book. That's a little easier. Oh um, yeah. Like yeah. I, and they're enjoyable. All, um, but you know, it's, it's all enjoyable, but like the stuff that really gets me excited are just is the weird shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I try to read it all. I honestly try to read it all. And I, I love to use a middle grades or YA graphic novel on the one hand and then once I have students kind of in a place where 
like okay we know we know what a comic is i like to bring out you know howard cruz or something and go <laughs> but look at this uh or you know nick Susannas, who did a dissertation in comics um, i need to that that sounds so cool i think he's a great guy and i'm like oh i have to, i have to read that it's, it's oh, on yeah. my list uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think about kids though like when i was a kid um i got super into kurt vonnegut i got super like i was age 11 which is a little young to really embrace all everything but like that was my first exposure to satire and that yeah. was what made me go oh my god this is possible like there are people like me out there. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 oh my gosh. And it, and it just, it made me so excited to write. Um, and of course I wrote horribly at age 11. I was just copying Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> <laughs> I was copying Kurt Vonnegut at age 16 and, and writing him letters and trying to get him to write me back. And yeah, I, I discovered him a little bit later. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm very sad that I didn't craft the perfect letter for him to respond to. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know. And I, I'm jealous of people that got to hear him speak uh, in person. But yeah, he, he spoke to the angry teenager in me um, when I was an angry teenager. And I think he, he still speaks to the angry teenager that lives inside of me. Uh, but I mean, Breakfast of Champions, right? You've got a, a multimodal text there. Um it's not a comic, but oh my goodness, the things that he did satirically through visuals and through the storytelling that he would bring onto the page were just uh, really thought provoking and uh, sometimes just made you go, ah, that's hadn't seen it that way before. He is an artist. I have, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm such a crazy fan of his or I always, you know, formative whatever that I had some of his drawings like that he did for like absolute vodka that he signed I mean they're just like really like I, I really don't care for this the American culture which kind of wants to pigeonhole you into one mm -hmm. like what do you want to be when you grow up choose one and it's like well no and I feel like most cartoonists kind of can't choose one we want to do it all like but but also most cartoonists do other things too like a lot of us are musicians I'm not or painters or you know dabble in other things um and I I really wish that the American like northern American culture would embrace more of that of like the renaissance mm -hmm. you know because I feel like a lot of times other art will inform other art so like my comics are informed by you know museum visits or multimedia installations like those all are very exciting movies obviously are a huge inspiration sometimes oh yeah 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 um just thinking about what kurt vonnegut would be writing right now if he were alive from just the past four or five years it would be really interesting and uh, that was that was another thing during the pandemic I kind of revisited his work just to think about, okay, wh what would this guy be saying right now <laughs> at this period in time? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting things. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, let me also mention, uh, because I was going to ask you about turning Japanese, which I've had the chance to look at on NetGalley as well. Um, that is currently being re-released uh, repolished and refinished brought back from a time ago so anything that you would want to share about that work um so that came out uh so i had the idea of that right after kiss and tell uh, and i was working on that right after kiss and tell which kiss and tell came out in 2011 but i was working on it in um until 2009 so i was working on japanese in 2009 and doing the character designs and yeah just just Putting it all together and so I had that pitch ready um, after the first book uh, that I did I feel like it kind of came out like I was done too early I feel like all publishing is kind of like what's hot right now and um, Asian American stories were not hot in 2009 or 2010 or even when the book came out in I think 2016 um, mm -hmm. It really wasn't until uh, Crazy Rich Asians came out that suddenly uh, me and all my Asian American friends were like getting calls from all sorts of people. What do you have for us? And I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
trying to tell us not to write about race all this time or you know about ethnicity and now you want our stories i'm like i've moved on i'm talking about this other thing now right. um but i mean it's it's good but it's also you know you can't you can't ex- really know what's going to be hot at any given moment um like right now middle grade super hot but it's like comics mm-hmm. take so long to do that i'm just like well by the time my middle grade book comes out in 2026 is it still going to be hot or are we going to move on to something that hasn't been done yet you know yeah yeah but it's so it's it's it's, it's interesting because like i feel like turning japanese the way they're marketing it they're calling it uh i they they use some word that I actually blushed when I read it. It's like a classic. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it did do surprisingly well and it connected with a lot of people like way more than I thought it would, but mm-hmm. it still came like a micro press at the time. Um, and now it's being re-released by a bigger, uh, bigger press. And I'm seeing it get more of the attention that I wanted in 2016, which is like, that's, it's, exciting like I'm like oh I'm glad that it's um kind of finally finding an audience um we we didn't really change much um I changed a few things here and there but mostly we just added uh an epilogue another epilogue kind of a reflection um but it's pretty much the same but oh and they made it bigger I saw the first copy yesterday at a reading I did a book passage in San Francisco and I'm like oh man I knew it was gonna be bigger but it's really bigger like nice, nice. Uh, so that's exciting um yeah it's exciting but it's also like I don't feel as connected to the book even though it's about me like I have you know I wrote it in like 20 2009 so it's 2023 like I'm like oh yeah it's like looking at baby pictures I'm like well yeah that's me mm-hmm. I'm not doing that anymore but like yay right. I'm glad it's finding an audience but like i'm on to collage like <laughs> but that's any any book that gets published like from the moment of signing until the moment it, you know you're holding it into your in your hands like at minimum you know once it's done like at minimum it's a year before you actually see it and a lot yeah. can happen in a year so that's kind of the the thing about publishing <laughs> right right yeah that you're I've heard that from several people that have come on the podcast of, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about this book right now, but I'm actually working on this one and this one and this one, you know, that are coming in like 2015 or 2025. I mean, 2026, like, yeah, this trajectory. I don't sing my old songs, but I'm like, let me tell you about this new thing I'm doing that you have no interest in (laughs) that you don't get to see for like five years. Right, right. (laughs) It's the showstopper. It's the showstopper. It's it's that classic, classic song. The classic. Um, so so let's let's talk about that as we're as we're sort of uh, wrapping up. And I, I tend to ask about um, like what you want readers to take away, but it sounds like that probably depends on the project because it sounds like you're putting a lot of different avenues of expression out, which is, which is great. I love that. Um, love that you're crafting for middle grades love that you're crafting collage uh, I love the breath I, I appreciate that thanks I mean I, I just have a short attention span so I think that's what <laughs> it comes down to what I think that when I feel like and this sounds really narcissistic but I don't mean it in this way where I feel like once I've figured out how to do something mm-hmm. instead instead of like oh I know how to do it well I'll keep doing it. I'm like, okay, no, I figured this out. Time to do the next thing. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. with turning Japanese, I feel like, okay, this is what I've been trying to do all these years, like with all the shorter comics or with Kiss and Tell. Like I, I don't feel like Kiss and Tell was very polished. Um, so I feel like turning Japanese was pretty polished and like did what I wanted to do, like got the thing that was in my brain out on paper. Um, but I'm like, okay, I'm done with that. And it's yeah. funny because once something is successful, everyone's like, okay, do more. I'm like, no, I did that. It's like, I already <laughs> solved that crossword puzzle I'm or, or that jigsaw puzzle. Now I want to figure out this other puzzle. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, right now my head's in the whole um, mixed media space of, of I, like, I love, like the, the thing I'm loving about collage, which I've always loved about collage, but 
but it wasn't very accessible until I got an iPad and Procreate, which just makes it so much easier to take a photo that you took and turn it into a collage. Um, yeah. it's, I, I, it's, like I get to use my like hobby photography skills. Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm using my narrative skills in like a new way. And like, like my favorite thing in the world is visual metaphors. And like that just opens yeah. up completely. Like every image that I use, like there's a metaphor in there. You just have, sometimes have to dig for it. Like, um, gosh, I don't, oh, but what, but what do I want people to get out of it? I mean, every story is actually the same. I just am looking for connection. Mm -hmm. um, and compassion or you know like I I just want to tell a good story and keep someone captivated and maybe make them think outside of themselves a little bit um, yeah. because that's what I get out of literature is you know sticking my feet in someone else's shoes and walking around a little and then also finding our commonalities I just think it's it's so hard to connect with people sometimes and it just it just feels so good when you can um yeah. so that's what I want to give and that's what I want to get and I want to make people laugh I love it <laughs> those those are all wonderful things wonderful things um th there's something just so archival about collage mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about like Nora Krug's belonging of like uh, exploring these books and exploring, you know, the past and the present and, and finding these multiple areas uh, to to explore and to put on a page side by side. And it's almost like every page gets to be something new when you're creating in that way, which I, I, I love. So I appreciate that you're exploring that crossword puzzle too. Do you remember the Griffith and Sabine books from like the early 2000s or late 90s? They were, it was a fiction, it, it, for some reason, it got really popular and, and I'm like, oh my God, this is changing what literature looked like. And then I think they did three of them and then nothing like that ever showed up on in popular culture again. But it was a, it was a fictional tale between, of two people and they're, it's basically their letters that they wrote to, to and from each other. Um, but the, the conceit of it was like, it was almost like a pop-up book where they make the actual letters and they make uh -huh, envelope yeah. art or postcard art. And so you're like, you get to open these letters that they wrote to each other or read them. And, 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 and it was a mystery because um, these two strangers are kind of pen pals and, and you're kind of unfolding who they are and what's going on. And it, it got a little meta after a while. Like it wasn't, the best story but it was very compelling to just read through other people's mail <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and that was one of the many inspirations for for what i've been doing lately was i'm like i want like i've always liked the voyeuristic uh aspect of diary comics and auto bio and um and and just the added layer where you're actually reading someone's mail like i mean it's so taboo you're not allowed to do that <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's right. That's what you hope to discover in a book. Hopefully you do get to read somebody else's mail and sort of <laughs> discover the world that they fashion for you and make sense of it. Uh, I just looked those up. They look beautiful and um, oh, yeah, they're gorgeous. not how... available in digital. It's it's from that time oh. period. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't even know how you would do that in digital because there, there is an opening aspect to it. Yeah. Uh, you, you would have to like they would have like little twist ties that you would have to untie to, to take the open the envelope and you know take the letter out it was really just I don't know how they produced that especially back then like that was early on like it wasn't until very recently that I feel like creators were allowed to work in color and that was mostly because yeah printing costs went down the internet mm -hmm. also we were told only black and white until like quite recently um so I don't know how they did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Very creative. Very creative. Yeah. Um, well, I, I love that. And I'll have to check that out and see if I can get a copy available um, from somewhere. But but any other works, any other events, any other pieces that you want to make sure to share? There's a middle grades. 
<laughs> piece that's on the way. We have that, that's not coming out until 2026. I wrote it, and Chong Lei Nguyen is going to be um, illustrating it, which uh... is such going to be so much fun. Um, and that's uh, that's coming out from Little Brown. It's about non-binary um, J-pop stars befriending like an ordinary little girl who's like and teaching her the value of uh, Japanese American community and and um, finding yourself creatively. Uh, I you said you mentioned that you found my work through losing the girl. Did you read the other two that came after it? Because I guess I that did. Yes. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I, I continued on the on the okay. track. Yeah. And whenever I, I see your name on a book, I am drawn to it. Oh, well, so the first of uh, that losing the girl, uh, which I was coming, I was working on that and uh, Kiss and Tell and Turning Japanese at the same time. So like I, wow. that years for the series to, you know, to come to an end, like and actually get published. And that um, it came out the last one came out right at the beginning of the pandemic. Like I had to cancel my book tour in March, 2020 because mm -hmm. we were home. So I feel like most people haven't read the last one, but I'm like, Oh, that's the exciting final conclusion. But like, I'm still super excited about that trilogy just because it was just, it was so new. Like it was such a, like, I, I was really trying something different like that's when I'm like you know what I'm just gonna make weird art from now on and like that that was me <laughs> trying. and um and that was me yeah executing it but also that story um was inspired by the friend that I thought you loved me is about only I wasn't ready to talk about it yet uh -huh. um because I had just found out like the reason why she had ghosted me. Um, I, so, so in summation, I Thought You Loved Me is about a formative friendship I had. She was my first girl kiss, but like we were just best friends for a very long time, uh, for about 14 years. And then one day she just disappeared from my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years later, I found out why she had disappeared. Um, and then another 10 years later, uh, I still hadn't gotten like given myself closure. I hadn't forgiven her for the, you know, the way she disappeared and all the things. And so I was like, I need to work this out. Maybe I'll write a book about it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So that's what this book is about. But, um, but yeah, so, so losing the girl was inspired as I was processing those feelings, but I was like, God, how could she do that to me? And the way that I decided to try to figure that out was to literally go like one of the characters is inspired by her and does similar things. And I'm, I'm like, okay, well, maybe if I write from her point of view, I can begin to understand her. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so when I was writing and drawing from her point of view and then writing and drawing from a character who was very similar to me and my point of view, and then other characters, like I was really just hopping from body to body and trying to see like the world through their eyes I mean obviously like any fiction like it starts out inspired by one thing and then the characters become their own character like they're no longer inspired they become their own people and the story you know they have a life of their own I'm just like the conduit um mm -hmm. but that 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 book was really special to me um and losing the girl was actually banned in Texas you know which really pissed me off but like without like, I don't know, that, that book is kind of like a very special baby for me in that, like, it was just, it, it felt kind of groundbreaking me, for me as a creator for like yeah. figuring out like how I'm going to tell stories in the future and how I'm going to even see life in the future and like how I'm going to find compassion when it's really challenging. Um, and uh, I don't think it's a lot of people have read them, but like, and I don't know children, like I'm not a kid's person, but like I hear from parents of children who are like, oh my God, my daughter will not stop reading your book again and again. I'm like, oh yeah, that's amazing. Cause I actually have no idea if kids will relate to it. Cause I'm an adult. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm glad that happens. <laughs> well, and there's an authenticity there, which I think kids respond to. I think when you share a story and you're exploring kind of a part of yourself and a part of your life in an authentic way. 
and I think kids respond to that so um, I, when I was at the age that kids are supposed to be when they're reading that like I was not reading young adult I was reading Kurt Vonnegut I was reading Dustin <laughs> mm -hmm. and I was completely disinterested in teenagers um <laughs> and they were like because I was a teenager I'm like I don't care like I want to I want to look beyond so I was like well you know what would I what book of teenagers might I, have I enjoyed like something that maybe reflects the people around me reflect reflects their flaws reflects like life and crushes and and you know how people aren't what they seem and um and that doesn't talk down to them like I think that's so important um because that's probably why I avoided YA when I was of that age true true it's like a sometimes it's like this representation of um what someone else thinks life as a as a young adult is and so yeah, yeah. it's like actually yeah. no <laughs> and I don't even know if I'm doing it correctly like I don't know but like I you know I'm just trying my best <laughs> yeah yeah it's that exploration of story and I love the that you're continuing to explore it and uh explore the questions in life I love that across the books and across life we should never yes. stop <laughs> exactly exactly um for listeners that want to find out more, are there particular, I know social media is a, is a hellfire landscape of uh, really? various things. Oh, but it's easy right now out there. <laughs> in, any spaces that you, you stay active on or um, web spaces as well. Man, I, 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 I am about to rage quit Twitter again. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so angry, but like, I have a consistent website, which is just my name.com, marinaomi.com. And I post, I post pretty frequently to, uh, to Instagram. Um, mm -hmm. So that's pretty consistent, but yeah, if you, you could find uh, everything at my name, Um Also, I kind of want to bring up my databases um, while I'm here. Yes. I'm founded um, the Cartoonists of Color and Queer Cartoonist Databases in 2014 and uh, the Disabled Cartoonist Databases in uh, 2018. And they're exactly what they sound like. They have thousands of people in them um, who fit that criteria um, and more are always welcome. You're welcome to like, if you identify as a queer or uh, disabled or are a cartoonist of color, um, you just submit your information um, and a lot of people find new authors that way to invite to conventions, to uh, make book, give book deals to, to invite to their gallery shows. Um, and also, it's, yeah, it's just a really great, I think it's, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I'm going to toot my own horn. It's a, it's do a it, do it. I've been doing it, you know, for, for the love of it, for all this, like almost 10 years, I do not get paid for it. I pay to do it. Um, and I do it because I think it's really important to have those things out there. Awesome. I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> Absolutely. The, the community. And as you mentioned, the connection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love that. And yeah. also I think it's so important to just take, put, put, someone else's shoes on you know mm -hmm. i think the beauty of comics too especially autobio comics um by underrepresented artists uh is that you get to see how they you, you get to see their world through their hand you know mm -hmm. through their eyes like it's not someone else is drawing them like they are drawing themselves they're drawing their own experiences they're showing you how they see the world um which is like an added layer from a prose book uh, because you know visual and all and uh... yeah yeah love that <laughs> see seeing the perspectives literally rendered on the page yeah it's my favorite thing about books <laughs> yeah my mine as well at least among the favorites and um thank you so much for a great conversation and for the kindness that you're putting out into the world and for the the stories that you're telling well, thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Glad to share this. Um, I'll share the link back around with you and with folks out there. And uh, also glad to share this in video form if you'd like the video. That's shared. fine. I'm sick for this. So. <laughs> um, all right. Th this is this is as dressed up as I get in the summer, so it works. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the summer and you're wearing long sleeves and black. That's amazing. 
<laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, again, thank you so much and uh, glad to talk with you anytime. Thanks, Jason. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you.